Um, but yeah, I'll just uh, want to say again, and I think I've said to everybody um, one one on one, um, just really, really happy to be here with you. Super excited. I know two years ago, um, we had no idea what was going to hit us. We'd heard some news about some weird thing that was going on in Seattle, and and some of us were doing like like foot bumps to say hi. Um, but but here we are, two years later, and we made it through. We're all here. Um, so I'm really glad to have you um, um, here today. Um, quick. Uh, we are recording this, um, and that's partly so that we can go back and look at these conversations later. Um, it's also um, for those people who can't be with us today. Um, there are some folks who sent their regrets for you know one reason or another, um, and uh, they would really love to be able to see the the recording. So there's a couple of things we'll have to do um, in the um, interest of that, and that is uh, when you're speaking, you'll have to have a mic on, and um, and Andrew has a handheld mic, so when we have discussion, um, uh, if you can use that mic, please do. It'll help, um, help us uh, be able to hear all, everybody's ideas. Um, and I'm going to make sure that I can see what I need to see here and um, go through things. So, um, yeah, my first thing is just thank you for coming out today. I know it's a super cold day in March. We never know what the weather's going to be like. Um, and, uh, and we couldn't do this meeting without all of you in the room. Um, we also couldn't do it without support of our funders, so UNI and the Living Roadway Trust Fund um, support the plant materials program at the TPC, along with uh, the uh, Irvin Prairie Project um, that uh, funds some of our work. So we are appreciative of that. Um, little reminder that the, the overall mission of the Tallgrass Prairie Center is to empower people to restore resilient, diverse tallgrass prairie. So, this meeting is part of that mission, to bring you, you all together to talk about the native seed supply um, really helps, I mean, it's an integral part of this mission. We also have our four key programs. Laura Jackson just um, introduced uh, the program managers for three of those programs, and Andy Olson, some of you met him, he's the Prairie and Farms program manager. He was down um, earlier uh, in the lobby. Um, we also have another member of the Tallgrass Prairie who is our Tallgrass Prairie Center, who's going to be here a little bit late this morning, but you'll all get to see Daryl Smith again. So i um, super excited. He had another meeting this morning, but he'll be with us later. So here's who we are in this room. And if I missed anybody, there's kind of an other category. Um, but I'd love to, uh, before you sit down for two hours straight, um, if you are a native seed producer, would you please stand up? <laughs> I love hearing that's us. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, and could, um, uh, so I'm also a native seed producer, and I want to say that uh, I'm super excited about all of the little plants that are coming up right now, especially the ones that I haven't grown before. Um, could you please uh, just briefly tell who you are, what your, your seed company is, and um, something you're excited about this year? <laughs> we need microphones. Sorry, Andrew, thank you. Angela gets to start. <laughs> I'm Angela Barker, Dan Allen. We're with Allen Dan Seed. Is that it? <laughs> Anything you're excited about this year? <laughs> it's okay. You don't I have to. Talk. I don't like this. <laughs> oh, you don't have to. It's fine. It's an optional thing. Uh, Matt Schaefer from uh, Resource Environmental Solutions slash Taylor Creek Restoration Nurseries in Broadhead, Wisconsin. What am I excited for? I'm excited to, this time of year, I'm sure most of the producers feel the same way. We're excited to just get out in the field and stop talking and planning. Just get ready to do some work. Thanks, Matt. Chelsea, you don't know what you're getting into. Uh, just say who you are, who you, uh, what your business is, and uh, just something you're excited about this year, if you want to. Okay. I'm Chelsea Buman. I'm with Backyard Designs. I work for my dad, basically. And we're excited to test out new equipment this year. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nicholas. I work for Hoxie Native Seeds, also work for my dad, and uh, we are excited for more rain than last year. Oh, <laughs> yes. Is there anybody else? Did we get everybody? 
Oh, yay. Hi, I'm Laura Levin. I'm a technician for the DNR's Prairie Resource Unit, and I guess I'm excited to revamp some of our irrigation system this year. Oh, we need to talk. <laughs> All right, I think we, did we get everybody? Everybody who want to talk? Um, how about roadside managers? I think we have a strong contingent of you all um, this time. Would you stand up and, and, and show who you are? All right. And whoever really, really wants to talk, stay standing. <laughs> yes! Hey, Corey. <laughs> uh, Corey Meyer, Winnish County Secondary Roads. I'm excited because we are entering into um, our own see growing ourselves to be somewhat self-sufficient on some items and also working with Iowa DNR and their um, cooperative this year so very interesting. something different yeah I want to pass on Tyler Tyler Kelly Story County Conservation um, we're also part of the roadside program we are unique in our county that our roadside program also har commercially harvests about 60 acres of diverse local ecotype seed out of Story County. We also have a pretty strong hand harvest program off of roadside remnants, uh, 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 pioneer cemeteries, and other rem private remnants in the county. Very interesting. Thank you. David Lehman, Bremer County. Um, excited getting geared up for this spring and getting some more native seed back out in the roadsides. Megan Huck, I'm with Lynn County Secondary Roads Department. I run the roadside program and I'm also excited to get out and plant more natives. I finally got our engineer to let me plant at bridges that we redo so there won't just be turf there. <laughs> so making progress. Oh, thank you all. This, this is wonderful. I'm so glad that uh, um, this group of folks has come together over this. Um, DOT folks, DOT and LRTF. I'm Tara Van Wass. I'm the coordinator for Living Roadway Trust Fund that helps support today and a couple other programs for you and I. Thank you. Hi, and I'm Shauna Godbold, the chief landscape architect at the DOT, and I'm about four years in and eyeballs deep into this. So <laughs> it's been interesting getting acquainted and reacquainted with some of the process I knew as a consultant in the baby years of getting roadsides developed. So when we had little bitty pockets of seeds going into certain areas and strategically located areas on the bypasses. So, so anyway, it's grown and it's been amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, here we go. Um, and for DNR, we've got, we've got Laura. You're kind of you got two two hats in my my scheme of things. How about NRCS? Good morning. I'm Nikki Williams. I'm a resource conservationist on the Ecological Sciences staff in the Des Moines State Office. For those of you who don't know, Al Lang left ship and he went over to FSA a couple of months ago. So I am the CRP program manager for the NRCS. Thank you for being here, Nikki. Um, uh, if it's anything like, uh, like it was for me the first couple years, I was the new Greg for a long time. <laughs> so I'll try not to introduce you as the new Al. <laughs> um, and then any other conservation agencies or organizations? I think I'm staring right at Lance right now and Tim. and so <laughs> Lance Brinsboy with Golden Hills RC&D. Uh, we're based in southwest Iowa. We've been doing prairie seed harvest um, on a pretty small scale with volunteers uh, focusing on Lust Hills ecotype on remnant prairies. We just got a specialty crop block grant to kind of expand that and work with interested growers to start producing native seed. Um, we're going to be starting on a really small scale and kind of focusing on some of the harder to find and harder to grow species. That's excellent. Yeah. And Tim, did you? You need it for the recording, yeah. Okay, uh, hi, my name is Tim Youngquist. I work with the uh, Iowa State University Agronomy Department strips program. Um, so we put strips of prairie out in crop fields. But personally, I really like native plant propagation as just kind of like a hobby. So I like coming and just kind of rubbing up against you folks and talking and figuring out what's going on. So nice to be here. So great. 
Um, did I, did we miss anybody? Yes, Lael, of course. I'm Lael, I work for Polk County Conservation and um, we do a ton of plantings every year, basically between, well, I, I guess I don't know on what scale, but a ton for us, anywhere between like 200 to 600 acres of restoration every year. Um, been working with Laura um, at the uh, Prairie Resource Center for quite a long time. Um, over 10 years, we've had production plots. Um, so yeah, glad to be here. Super exciting. Didn't miss anybody else, right? Okay, all right, this is good. Um, so I'll, I'll spend a little time just kind of going through uh, how the meeting's gonna run, but I just wanted to um, just highlight our objectives for the day uh, because it's, <laughs> for me, I get to talk and it's easy for me to forget the important things, but um, uh, really the, the key thing is building and strengthening our connections because the, the supply chain itself is fundamental to being able to do restoration in the state. Um, so uh, let's, let's stay strong in our connections. Also staying informed on developments um, in areas like policy, um, research, and, and business um, of uh, native seed production. And um, one thing I really want to get to by the end of today is to start clarifying some of the issues that we could possibly work on. You know, there's some things that are kind of above us that are, that are intractable issues that, 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 that we can't grab a hold of. Sometimes they're slippery ones. But there are things that we could work on together. And, um, and identifying those things and, and the people who want to collaborate on those and ways that we could do that and start moving things forward stepwise, um, I, I would love to do that. So, um, uh, yeah, hopefully we, we meet some of those objectives today. Um, I thank everybody who filled out that registration form. And I'm not going to read through these, but these were the kinds of things that you all said that you want to talk about today. And a lot of this is, is it's in your hands. Um, uh, we are going to have uh, presentations today, but there will be time for discussion after each of the presentations. And then in the afternoon, starting at 2.30, it's going to be open networking and discussion time. So if there's things that you really want to get to, um, it's partly in your hands. We can help you facilitate that by you know, organizing tables where you're, where you're like, hey, I really want to talk about this with these people. We can help to, to organize that and corral people for you. Um, but it's, it's really a lot of it's up to the group to, to get that to happen. Um, so here's just the overview of the agenda, how things are going to flow. Uh, hopefully, we're close to on time. Ah, we're two minutes over already. Um, we're going to have presentations and discussion all morning, 30-minute um, uh, presentations. So 15 to 20 minutes of that will be talking, and then it'll be open to discussion and questions. So hopefully, we can chunk right through that. We'll have lunch from 12 to 12.55. That is provided, thank you, to our um, LRTF funding. Um, then uh, after lunch, we'll have a couple more presentations. The, the DOT and the NRCS will be presenting after lunch. Um, then we'll have that break work, breakout and networking time. And finally, we'll, we'll wrap up at 4, uh, 4 to 4.30. Um, if you do have to leave early, we understand. Um, please pick up an evaluation survey and fill that out and return that um, along with your name tag at the registration desk. Um, before you leave, that'll help us um, with next year's planning and making this meeting a more valuable experience for all of us. Um, so here's our lineup. I'm going to start. I get to, get to make myself first because then I don't have to move the microphone as much. Um, then we're going to have Johnny Zook from the Pennsylvania Department of Ag talking about the um, study that's been done of native seed testing lab uniformity on a national level. Um, he's going to be zooming in from Pennsylvania. Uh, then Nicholas Lirio from Hoxie Native Seed will be talking about the um, marketing aspects for native seed. Um, Christine Nemec from the Tuggeress Prairie Center will be talking about the uh, native seed uh, for county roadside programs. Um, Justin will be um, giving us some updates on uh, restoration research, particularly related with the timing of planting. Um, and after lunch, uh, Shauna and Tara are going to give us an update on what's happening with um, the Iowa DOT and Living Roadway Trust Fund. And then Nikki um, Williams is up. Uh, um, with uh, some uh, discussion of uh, Iowa CRP and the um, seed planning process coming up. And so any questions about how things are going to run today? Anything that I forgot? We're good? 
Okay, so <laughs> we're already a little bit late, so I'll try to talk even faster than I normally do to get everything in. Uh, but I wanted to take this opportunity since, you know, it's been, I think, uh, almost four years since I started working as a temporary technician at the Tallgrass Prairie Center um, uh, to just update you on some of the things that I've been thinking about and doing in the program. Um, and then, you know, I, I would love your input because um, the program is, doesn't exist for itself, it exists for you all. So um, I'm happy to have your, um, your input. And once again, thank you to you and I and to the Living Rotary Trust Fund for supporting the program. So it's not exactly a mission statement for the program, but it's pretty darn close. Um, so our goal is to support a, a native seed supply for roadsides and other restorations that is diverse, regionally appropriate, source identified, and affordable. It's a big goal. <laughs> um, so to serve that goal, um, we do produce source identified seed, uh, parent seed for the native seed industry. And um, uh, several of our seed producers here have used that, that parent seed or foundation seed in the past. Um, we do things like this to facilitate network and communication. We disseminate information through our website, the Native Seed Manual, um, and uh, videos on our, our website. And um, I do a little bit of this, like spare time kind of work in promoting uh, appreciation and understanding uh, of prairies. So over the, um, the course of this program, which of course, you know, long predates me, um, it's about a 30-year-old program. Um, we have produced over 80 species that have ended up in the, um, the native seed market um, and 145 different ecotypes um, of, of those things. Um, we don't maintain all of those species in continuous production in our, in our production fields, but we do have a seed bank and a walk-in cooler that's under excellent conditions for seed storage. Um, but even so, um, seed ages over time. So one of the, the chief things that I've been involved in since starting at the Tallgrass Prairie Center is, is this process of refreshing our seed bank. So uh, we've got seed lots in there, some of which are um, 10 or more years old um, and need to be uh, grown out in our fields in order to get fresh seed off of those again so that we're not sending you seed that is substandard quality. Um, so that's just been one of my main goals is figuring out a process for making sure that, this, that we're doing this efficiently, considering that we um, have, you know, we have resources and, and staff, but you know, there, there are limits on what we can um, do uh, every year. So our process for refreshing um, that stored seed is to grow out reserved generation one seed uh, and produce a generation two from that. So here you can see an example of a field that we had last year of Asclepias verticillata, world milkweed, um, and some of the seed that resulted from um, that field. So we've got that generation two field and the generation two seed. Um, uh, Greg Houseseal, who was in the program before me, um, really, I mean, there was a lot of foresight that went into this and uh, stored uh, you know, significant samples of that generation one seed. So that's gonna be a long time before we have to go back into our remnant seed bank or go back and re-harvest from remnant prairies, which we know we can, you know, this, those things aren't always there when you go back to them. Um, so uh, we've got a supply that's gonna last us for multiple rounds of this process without going beyond a generation two. Um, if we don't have, there's been a few species where we don't have any reserved seed, uh, then we do go back into our remnant accession freezer and start from that. So um, for instance, there was um, white prairie clover, didn't have any of that left in either production seed or a reserve generation one seed. So we went back into the, um, the stored um, accession seed and it was amazing. You know, we went into this 15 to 20 year old seed in the freezer, pulled that out, scarified it, um, germinated it, and, and like, I overdid it. I'm known for this. But I overdid it because, you know, you, you always kind of shoot over what you think is going to come up. Everything came up. I think more seeds came up than we planted. It was crazy. Um, and then the rabbits ate them all. So um, we're working on that. But that's our process. So um, because we've got those 145 ecotypes um, and a lot of them are getting old and we really need to refresh those things. We've got to have a process for figuring out which, ones, which lots need to come out. Um, so the first pri priority is um, cases where we don't have any seed in the production seed bank. So if a grower talks to us and says, hey, Laura, I need you know, white prairie clover, I'm like, ah, I don't have any. And it's going to take me a while to get that in the field and grown. 
Um, so I'm trying to identify those lots where I think that we're going to be in that situation and get those in the field. Also, the cases where there's declining seed viability. For a long time, we didn't have a lot of information on that because we were primarily testing the lots that were going out for release um, and didn't have the funding to test um, more regularly. Now we're, we're thankful that we have enough money in our budget to get things on a testing schedule so that we have a better understanding of what's aging um, and what's you know, still viable and what needs to be refreshed. Um, and then there's high demand species. So um, got a picture of the butterfly milkweed over there, I swear. I get more requests for butterfly milkweed than anything else. And of course, there's a lot to do with monarchs there. It's a showy plant. Um, it's, in, it's in high demand. And it doesn't produce for very long in the production fields, at least in my experience. It's, it's a, one that gets a lot of disease problems over time and has to be replaced. So um, that's one of those examples for that. But who in here has, the, has solved the mystery of demand forecasting for native seed? Raise your hand. <laughs> OK, neither have I. But um, if you have ideas, if you're looking at your fields and you're thinking, OK, you know, a couple years out, I'm going to need some more of this stuff, give me a heads up. I'll see what I can do and, and, and get that stuff moved forward. I will prioritize the things that you tell me um, are, uh, are needed. So I love the input on that. OK, some improvements that we've made in that seed bank management was um, you know, getting the increased funding for testing of seed lots so that we can get things in a rotation and have a better handle on what's really viable in our seed bank. And then we also have, um, you know, over the 30 years of the program, the record keeping evolved over time. And so we had multiple spreadsheets that all had to be kind of updated every time you did anything. And, I don't know about you, but I'm error prone. So I, I needed a system that would unify these different data sets and make it possible for me to answer a question. When somebody says, what's the county of origin of this seed lot? I can go in there, I can pull that up in our database, and I can find that. The inventory is updated when I release seed to a grower or when I harvest seed and I enter that information. So it's all unified in one place, and I feel like I have a better handle now when I'm planning on what needs to be grown out, what we've got, what we need. Um, and then what we are going to propagate in a given year. So that data management piece has been huge. Um, and then as a side effect of all this um, refreshing of seed, we get to test out some production methods and have some fun out in the field with that. Um, it just happened a couple years ago that we had uh, butterfly milkweed again. Uh, makes for pretty pictures. Um, and we had butterfly milkweed and a cream wild indigo that we were growing out. Um, and we had plenty of plants and we had some field space. So we thought, well, why don't we interplant those? And let's see what happens if we throw a grass in the mix. And so we have these, all these little plots that we planted. Didn't take us any more labor to do that. Um, but I don't have a research program for native seed production. So um, some, I interested some AmeriCorps members and a teacher extern who was working with us for the summer in collecting the data on that. And they crunched some numbers on it. It's not publishable data or anything. But the Asclepius really did not like having um, a grass neighbor. Uh, it was slightly suppressed. The Baptisia, on the other hand, the wild indigo, um, was happiest when it had all the neighbors possible. So um, we, uh, are, we're excited to see if it actually produces some seed this coming year. Um, one of the things that the program has really always been known for is bringing uh, new species into the, the seed market, uh, uh, new ecotypes. And I'm excited that this year I finally got out and started uh, making new collections from, from remnant prairies. Um, uh, it took me a while to kind of get myself uh, up to speed on the whole process of going out and scouting, of recording those locations, use some um, GIS uh, tools to help record that stuff and get back to those um, populations. But I ended up collecting enough of parasol white top, of common bone set, and of blue vervain to get some new um, ecotypes into production this year. Fingers crossed all the seed comes up in the greenhouse. Um, so far, the common bone set is coming up gangbusters. So I'm super excited to have that and be able to make some of these fall flowering um, uh, wet prairie uh, uh, plants available to folks. Um, while out there, you know, there's always other things that you find um, that are in seed. So I you know, made some collections, some exploratory collections of some other things as well um, while out there. Um, some things that I noticed while out in remnant prairies is uh, they're not in a safe place in a lot of places. Um, there's a lot of variation from county to county and, and kind of the resources that, that um, I think that folks have to manage those, those places. Um, I'm concerned about the status of our remnant prairies. 
Um, and I have developed a hatred for a plant for the first time in my life. What? Did I hear a suggestion? What Do you, is it? You want to know. You want to know? Read canary grass. Hate that plant with a passion. Exterminate it. Just, just get rid of it. It's so horrible. Um, but I also want to put a shout out to all those people who are making do with very little resources. I mean, there's some counties where you're like, how do they find the funding to actually get out there? And how do they have the expertise to do as good a job of their, as they're doing? So there's, uh, there's really some, we need to support those people who are, are managing our remnant prairies. And I want to thank the DNR, um, the uh, Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation, um, county conservation boards, um, private individuals, the Nature Conservancy, all the people who allowed me to go and collect seed this fall. I'm probably missing some there in my list. I'm thinking about some new species for next year. Um, uh, I know people have expressed an interest in early season forbs. Um, uh, the wild strawberry is one where you go out in any random remnant prairie and it's like the understory of that prairie. And I'd love to see that in production. And I understand it's really fun to clean because you put it in a blender. Um, and I have not, uh, no, it's not an ulterior motive. I don't want to just go out and eat strawberries all, all, all June. But um, I'm excited about that one. I've heard that um, cool season grasses are an interest. Uh, and I'm interested in Dicanthelium libergii because I'm finding that in high quality um, black soil remnant prairies. Even in some that are degraded, like with brome invasion, this, this plant is hanging on. Um, and it's a beautiful native grass. It even has pretty full color. I mean, go figure. Now, if I can just get enough viable seed to get this stuff started. Um, it, a little intrigued by the hemiparasites. I know that's a long shot, uh, but then maybe that's my moonshot. Uh, so I collected some Pedicularis lanceolata last fall, interested in Pedicularis canadensis as well. Um, but I, and I know some people are starting to work out some um, propagation methods on that. And then sedges. I know folks want more sedges. I'm interested in your suggestions for species that you'd like to see out there. Um, I'd also like to, you know, make some connections between people to see if the sedges that are currently in production can get into some more mixes and that kind of thing. So um, if we can uh, do some of that tinkering. So I'm interested in your ideas. I love to see people taking notes and um, holler at me, because if I go over time, we might not have time for much discussion. And then finally, here's the thing. Oh, this is not finally, but this is the thing where I'm interested in your input. I've been thinking about the Iowa ecotype zones. Um, so uh, the IoT ecotype project zones are these that are delineated by the three county um, zones. I think they were an amazing compromise that was made in the, the origination of the Iowa ecotype project 30 years ago. Compromise between um, keeping some of the, the regional variation that's present within the state, but also making it some practical considerations. So we didn't just like have daimonian lobe ecotype versus you know, Iowan surface ecotype and that kind of thing. Um, on the other hand, we've seen over time that it's really difficult to have a marketplace for all three of these ecotypes for all of the species um, that's viable in a, in a larger scale. Um, so what we, in, in effect, end up seeing is that when folks bid out for seed, they're going to use the um, Iowa yellow tag seed, but basically use whichever ecotype they can get a hold of in the amounts and, uh, that they need for their project at the price that they need. So. Um, I'm starting to question a little bit whether this is the right model forever. Okay. Um, and I know that I, this is why, this is one of these things, I'm putting it out there because I want to hear from you all, because um, I don't have a hard and fast decision on this, but I want to show you um, an example of a different approach um, that's a climatic-based approach that's not defined by state boundaries. This is um, uh, defined by the National Forest Service. These are called the provisional seed zones. Um, they're sometimes combined with like Amarnik level ecoregions, but this, what I'm showing right here, is just um, the climatic zones. If you are a gardener and you've ever done anything, hi, good morning. If you've ever done anything with like the USDA um, heart, plant hardiness zones, this is real similar. Um, in that they're dealing with five degree Fahrenheit temperature zones um, that are winter, um, winter temperatures. So it's a kind of a hardiness thing. And then the, the lighter, brighter color off on the left, so sorry Lance, you're out there, um, that is uh, based on an aridity measure. So they're combining like precipitation with, um, with uh, humidity. Um, oops, I'm gone too far. So uh, this is one thing that I'm kind of considering because you see it sort of divides Iowa fairly neatly into two zones. No matter what kind of a zone definition you make, you're taking a gradient of things and you're drawing a line through it. So it's kind of 
uh, but we're stuck in this, this having to make compromises with, with our biology, with you know, business and practicality. So this would be a, a northern Iowa zone. This would be a southern Iowa zone. There's this corner out of southeast Iowa that gets, ends up in this warmer region. Um, and there's this more arid western part. But then these zones, they cross over state lines and they just kind of keep going. So it's not, there's not like the Iowa stuff stops here. There's this potential that you could think about, um, uh, at least from a climatic standpoint, from winter hardiness, um, that there, there might be some appropriateness in thinking about transfer, not just within the state, but maybe across the state lines. So it's, it's something to think about. I know there could be some discussion about this, and I encourage that. And, and like this afternoon, if there's some people who want to talk about this, I'd love to hear from you. Um, then a couple of other things. I'm really interested in doing a reboot of the Native Seed Production Manual that hasn't been published in, until, uh, since uh, 19, or 1910. <laughs> 2010, not quite so long ago. Um, we have a lot of species to add. Um, uh, we could update the production methods in there, maybe add new kinds of resources. And I'm interested in talking to um, especially seed producers about what new kinds of resources we could add. We had some conversations last April about some of these ideas. Um, but I'd like to start moving forward on those now. Um, and then I'd like to have this available online in a very searchable way, but also have a print version available so that you can use it in places where you didn't have internet. And then finally, there's all kinds of other things that I'm trying to do to um, promote awareness and, and uh, also networking and connection within the, um, the industry. So I present at meetings to stay connected with people at larger scales and know what's happening kind of in native seed industry in the broader uh, part of the US. I like to educate about yellow tag whenever I give a presentation. So this, this picture gets a lot of, um, a lot of uh, play. Um, and then I'm also, I love to go out and visit native seed producers. So um, if I haven't been to visit you yet, um, please let me know and I'll, I'll come and, uh, and check out your operation and see how you do things and, and uh, explore ideas with you. Uh, I have a newsletter that I publish about four times a year. If there's content you'd like to see in there, if there are information sources that you think I should know about, events that, that should be out there, please let me know. Um, uh, and there's also an email group called Native Seed uh, and that's uh, like a Google group works like a listserv, um, so if you're interested in that, if you have questions, topics that could generate discussion on that, um, please uh, participate. Uh, and then there's stakeholder meetings like this. At the end of today, please make sure that you fill out the evaluation survey because I need your suggestions to make this um, you know, continually a, a better experience. And I think, hopefully, I'm not way over time. I think we're good. We can get Johnny in here um, perfectly on time. Um, so, uh, are there questions and thoughts, ideas um, that you have right now that we could uh, talk about um, before it's time for Johnny's talk? Back to the, I suppose, potential of a new um, ecosystem system. Ecotype, uh, yeah, the ecotype, ecotype definitions, system, yeah. 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 Um, so, Iowa ecotype, a lot of times it if you have any zone, you can sell one, two, or three. So similarly, if you were in, in the central zone, would you then have the leniency of selling to the zone north of you, but then I saw that goes into Wisconsin. Does that make sense? So, I, so the, the zones in Iowa kind of stretch to the border of the state, but then where would the, the leniency of the zones kind of stretch to? Do you believe or um, have we thought that far through? I, just curious. You know, I think the, and you know, Justin may be able to weigh on this because he does a lot more seed purchasing than I do, but I think it probably depends on the buyer and, you know, who, who you're working with. Um, uh, I think some of the, the purchases that go across state lines right now are into Missouri. Um, and Missouri, I've talked to the, the person there in, um, in their NRCS, and their NRCS has more stringent requirements for certain conservation practices than ours does in terms of uh, the, the zone of origin of that seed. Um, but they require county of origin information on that seed that, that goes to Missouri. Um, so they're willing to buy Iowa seed, and sometimes they think it might even be more appropriate than some of the seed that's raised, say, in southern, southern Missouri. So for their prairie region, they're going to get some Iowa seed. Um, they just want to know what county it's from. Um, and then they have, uh, you know, definitions for different practices of, of what range it can come from. So 
it's not a satisfying answer to your question. Um, but yeah, Iowa's own seed does go across the border. Different consumers are going to request different kinds of information about that seed. But it already happens. Um, and uh, one thing I didn't mention is I'm not planning on taking like and, and, and eliminating Iowa Ecotype 2. Uh, if we have existing Generation 1 seed in our seed bank, I'm going to continue to grow that stuff out. It's just when I'm generating new ecotypes, I'm thinking about using that, um, the National Forest Service um, guidelines as, as a potential model going forward. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you. Other um, questions or comments? Just a question or suggestion or request, I guess. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you redo the new um, the new native seed manual, what we just got a brush machine this year, so I'm noticing um, how drastically the specs change when you then go to your air cleaner. So I'm wondering if um, if like to include information regarding these are the specs if you run it through a hammer mill versus these are the specs if you run it through a brush machine, I think would be hugely helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, is like um, noting caution when you have species that get damaged by said pieces of equipment. So like I yes. keep running into issues with Lyatris, like damaging the seed. Right. So I, I, I keep trying to figure out like, it, is it better off to run it through the brush machine, better off to run it through a hammer mill, better to run it through nothing, <laughs> just hand clean it. Um, so to include information like that, I think would be hugely helpful for those of us that are on a much smaller scale. I mean, I know I'm sure all the producers already know, but those of us who are cleaning our own seed, it'd yeah. be very helpful. Absolutely. And you know, if you wanted to be a part of that, you know, maybe we form, I hate to call it a committee or a working group, but maybe we form a group that is going to work on this. Um, and if you wanted to be a part of that, um, to make sure that that is included, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do a ton of hand harvest. I mean, we probably hand harvest like over sixty species. Mm -hmm. So, I mean that that then tells you like I can I can tell you which species are important for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. 